Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, and walk us through the uh, uh, the slides that we have and the demo that uh, we put together. Um, so, and uh, just to stop and uh, you know ask any questions that you have in the chat, and uh, and I'll try and answer them as we go through, or uh, or I'll take them at the end. Um, so, okay, so here we go. So how to save up to 80% on hosting, uh, or, or the other way of saying it is uh, how to go serverless on, uh, on Drupal. Okay, I'm Salim Lakani. I'm the uh, CTO and co-founder of DevPanel. Uh, here are the different ways to find me on, online. Uh, today's, uh, the outline for today's uh, talk is essentially we'll go through a little small case study and then go through the three simple steps of, uh, of getting your savings, uh, looking at the tools and different options of, uh, of setting this up and looking at static sites. That's another good way of realizing your savings. And, uh, and then we can do the Q&A. So the case study I'm going to talk about is uh, for Voice of America, uh, VOA, and they had uh, when we did a proof of concept with them, it was uh, we we saw a greater than seventy five percent savings. They were spending over a million dollars uh, for hosting like four sites, and uh, on a on a on a big name, uh, you know hosting company, uh, Drupal hosting company. And we, we put them on, uh, they were looking at, they had at that time, they had 43 other sites and they were looking at uh, putting those on, uh, moving those to Drupal as well. And uh, they were trying to figure out how they would fit that in their budget. Uh, their higher ups were, were not very happy with the million dollar tag. So they were looking at alternatives and uh, we got them to, um, to $128,000 on AWS for their annual bill. They were getting about uh, two, one to two billion hits per month on their sites. So this was, uh, this was handling one to two billion hits on, uh, on, their, on some of their sites, on some of the larger sites. And when we did the simulation, it was equal traffic and load simulation. Uh, and we, at that time, we worked with AWS to do the, make sure that we were doing everything right, that they were doing everything right. They actually wanted to bring in AWS to make sure that we were doing everything right. Uh, so we had some checks and balances there. And, and uh, this, was, this was based, these numbers were based on on-demand uh, and reserved uh, pricing. So the way AWS works is you can, you can take on-demand their MSRP pricing, and then you can say, okay, I'm gonna reserve this for one year or three years. And then this is what uh, they'll give you a discount based on that. So we used a one-year reserve pricing for uh, the things here. And this was based on, a, I believe, a one-year reserve pricing for all the all the things. Uh, yeah, you can see the first 12 month total. So, and, and not using spot instances. The architecture that we're using can actually use spot instances that can give you up to 90% discount, but they did not want to use that in their estimation. So they wanted to go high on the estimation. So they, they went down from a million dollars to $128,000. The load testing we did was uh, targeted all towards the origin. So we did not actually bring in the CDN because we wanted to test to see how the origin would scale up and down. And uh, we stress tested the architecture, both cold and uh, warm starts um, to see how it would respond. And then uh, we did multiple stress testing uh, we use multiple stress testing, testing tools like JMeter, Siege, and uh, AWS also has their distributed load testing tools. We use that. Um, and then here are some of the results. And for performance testing, we used uh, different tools like uh, the web page performance testing and Lighthouse 
And this was comparable, actually slightly faster than uh, their production, current production hosting. And we, do, we weren't using CDN. So uh, this, these were the results. Well, I don't, I don't actually know why this is checkbox here, but um, the auto scaling worked really well. So uh, you can see we, we were actually in this test, we were picking up spot instances, uh, although the estimate was not based on it. Um, so we were picking up, this was all auto scaling. You can tell we were putting load on it and this was all auto scaling uh, very well up and down. And how did we do this? So, so uh, three, three things. Uh, one is going serverless, uh, following best practices and, and uh, using development and automation heavily, development and automation tools heavily. So serverless, whenever I say serverless, there's this tendency of people saying, oh, this is all serverless. So serverless means uh, actually it does involve servers. But it, uh, it's servers that you are not managing. So this is a very important point to mention is that these are servers that you are not managing. There's always servers involved, but somebody else is managing it. So you, you don't have to worry about these servers at all. Uh, uh, the serverless is also referred to as event-driven computing, or you'll hear it as function as a service at times uh, in microservices. So these are all kind of lumped into the serverless category. Um, and then, and then the kind of the way it works is that you have a you have a reserved um, uh, infrastructure that uh, capacity at the at the bottom, which is generally what the traffic that you're getting, and then this and then the spikes that you get are are can be picked up with uh, either on demand instances or on demand uh, capacity. Uh, with on-demand pricing or spot pricing. So as you get more, as you get more spikes, uh, as you get spikes, then uh, we, we use Kubernetes. So, so we'll pick up, uh, we use spot instances and uh, using spot pricing, we'll scale up. And then uh, as the spikes go down, we'll release those, uh, that capacity and scale back down to the reserved capacity. So that's how auto scaling works and that way, you're never holding on to infrastructure that you don't need. You're never holding on to capacity that you don't need. Uh, generally, when you're buying capacity from other providers, what you're doing is you're paying for a certain level of capacity and uh, they might be doing auto scaling on the back end themselves, but you are generally paying for, uh, for reserve, you're paying up here for a certain number, for certain capacity all the time. So, so if you follow best practices from, uh, from Amazon, you're, you want to right size your services. So you don't overbuy your services. And of course you're not underbuying them. You want to aggressively auto scale them. Uh, use reserved and spot instances to save up to 90% on your, on your bill. And, and this requires some architectural considerations so we can go into that later if, uh, if time permits. And then uh, as much as you can, you want to offload things to the CDN. And the other thing is, if you can pay AWS directly, right? So you can cut out the middleman. If you can cut out the middleman, then, then you know, you're, you're miles ahead, right? Uh, and you're only paying with AWS or with your cloud provider, you're only paying for what you're using. Um, so, so here we're using AWS as an example. You can, you can be using other cloud providers. In this case study, we were using AWS. Uh, the cons for using architecture like this is, is for AWS, especially the setup, uh, management, configuration, backups, restoring, security, patching, upgrades, mod. I mean, the list goes on. The level and the cost of expertise required to manage this infrastructure can be can be huge and not everybody has that. So, and it's not their level of core competency. So what do you do, right? So you want to, what you want to do is de-risk AWS and you want to de-risk your provider. And that's why people normally go with, you know, just a provider itself. But if you have the right tools, 
then then you can uh, you know with the right tools you can have your entire point and click software development lifecycle. If you can make your AWS environment like Pantheon or Acquia, that's that's what, where you want to be, right? Uh, you want to automate everything. So the whole setup, management, configuration, backup, restore, security, patching, everything should be automated, right? Um, and, and then you also want to have somebody to call if there's, you know, tools break and tools have problems and, and you'll want to upgrade things at times. So, so you'll, you'll want features and uh, you'll want to know how to do this and that. So you want somebody to call. Uh, so, so that's what you want. Those are the three big things that you want with your tools and automation. So that's when that's when we stepped in, and that's how we helped uh, Voice of America, and that's how we work with different companies. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit of that. Um, the demo that I'm going to walk you through today: uh, How do you connect AWS with your Dev Panel account? And this will set up your setup and secure your account, create the infrastructure, create uh, configure backups, auto scaling and so on. Um, then we'll create a project um, in your in your account, essentially uh, from scratch or using quick starts. Uh, develop, you can do development in a browser. Um, you can uh, We'll do, uh, you can create dev test live environments, feature environments, everything uh, in your in your own uh, account. You can use tools like uh, uh, for to manage your uh, database and uh, and VS code to manage your, you know, to, to your IDE to to everything in the browser. And then you can manage your sites, do your backups, restore collaboration and deploy uh, in your serverless and infrastructure, you can deploy dynamic sites and you can de uh, deploy static sites. So we'll walk through all of those uh, next. So let me switch to the other, give me one sec. Okay, can you see my screen? This is dev panel. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. So, uh, in Dev Panel, there's this uh, concept of workspaces. In a workspace, you have all your projects will be in a workspace. Um, each project is connected to a repo, and in a project, you'll have different applications. Each application is essentially uh, a branch. An application is an instantiation of a branch. So. A workspace can be connected to, it's connected to one uh, account on, uh, in AWS. And you can have multiple workspaces connected to the same account. So here, we'll, uh, we're creating a workspace. And this is how you connect, you create a workspace and you connect it to your account. So you go through, you connect it to, you can create, link it to a new account. If you link it to a new account, you'll, you'll go through different steps. But if you connect it to an existing account, you just click next. Uh, you'll invite your owners and admins of the workspace. And then you can create a new cluster or you can use an existing cluster. Uh, you set up the network, the region, you can set, up, set it up as a multi-AZ or, uh, or single AZ. Uh, you can set up the number of nodes, uh, spot instances if you want to use them and manage database. Again, this is managed by AWS. So you can type in your MySQL and uh, so on. And then you agree to, uh, to the terms and condition, which is basically, you're not going to mess with it because we're managing it. So, uh, and that's, that's what you, when you click on complete setup, this is when we set up the infrastructure in your account. So everything is set up in your account on AWS. So once this is set up, you'll get a workspace like this and you go into a workspace and, and then you'll have different projects in it. Each project is connected to a repo. So in this project, there's just one branch which is already deployed and this is connected to a repo. Okay. I'm gonna go back 
And I'm going to create a new project so you can see how it's created. So I'll create a new project and click Next. And then I can pick from, these are out of the box. You can create your own applications as well. Uh, and this all runs on Kubernetes, so you can create any type of application. You're not restricted to uh, LAMP type of applications. I'm going to uh, create a Drupal 9 application. And it's a GitLab. I'm going to link my Git, GitLab account. There's a pop-up off screen that links the two accounts. I'm going to create a new repo and give it uh, And in the background, this is what this is doing is first thing it's going to do is it's going to create a repo in my GitLab account. And that repo is going to be the source of all truth, all the code is that's the code that we're going to be using. And uh, we use uh, Terraform and Ansible for, uh, for creating all of this, uh, for doing all of this magic here. So. And if you go look at this repo now, you'll see that this is your basic uh, composer-based Drupal. I'm going to go back and I'm going to deploy this. So when I deploy it, I can deploy it from scratch. I can import from uh, I can import the database and files, um, or I can copy the database and files from another application that's in Dev Panel. We don't have another application running in this in this uh, this project, so I can't clone it. So I'm just going to start it from scratch. I can uh, I can lock it if I want to, so that when it starts up, it's automatically locked. I'm just going to keep it unlocked. I can I can put it on a spot server, or I can put it on an on-demand server. I can enable or disable the code server. I can enable or disable PHP my admin. I can click advanced config, configure the storage. Um, I can change the container image. I can change the app route, the web route, and so on. I'm just going to leave it as is. And I'm just going to click on deploy. So this takes about five minutes or so to deploy. But uh, right before this, I had one that I had already created. So I'm just going to go to that one. So once it's deployed, you'll see that it says deployed. And once it's deployed, you get something like this. And you get the application that's already created. And with it, you get PHP My Admin, which is your database management tool. So, and this UI is like really old. The tool is really old, but it works. Um, and you get VS Code, which is it's it's code server, but it's essentially VS Code. If you work with it, uh, it's an IDE. And there's a built-in terminal. So, and we preload this with Composer. So you'll get Composer and then you'll get Trash. So all of this stuff is preloaded for you. And then this is a live IDE. So you don't, if you're using this, you don't need a local dev environment. Not to say that you can't have a local dev environment because we're using Git as a source of truth. Uh, so you can always sync, if you're using a local dev environment, you, all, you can always sync with, uh, with your Git repo and then just do a Git pull here. But if, you're, if you don't have a local dev environment, you can always use this. And I'll just give you an example. If I go into index.php, 
I go here and I say, and I come back to this and I refresh this page. We'll see PHP info. Now this happened without me committing the code to Git or anything. So this is a live IDE. You wouldn't want to run this on master. <laughs> you want to run this on the developer feature branches and then pull it, pull the code into master. But now if I, if I comment this out, I go back in and I refresh, it's back, right? So, and the nice thing about this is if you're going in here, two or more people, you can actually do pair programming. So two or more developers can come in and open this VS code from here and they could be programming on the same IDE. So you can do remote, remote support for your other developers right from here. Um, and this is all token-based access. So, uh, so you, need, you need access to this project uh, for people will need access to the project for them to get access to this VS code and phpMyAdmin. You also get, once this is instantiated, uh, once this branch is running, application is running, you can see your activities of who did what and when. So you can open the log and see what happened. You can uh, look at your backups. So this was a backup I did earlier. You can download your code. Um, click to download and there's my download that came down here. I can download my code, the database and files. I can restore with one click. Uh, I can create a CDN on this, and I can create a testing CDN and a production CDN. So there's a testing CDN doesn't require us to get a certificate and stuff. We just create it from the back end. A production CDN, you have to put in your, uh, your domain name. So you can set up webhooks. If you do a webhook, then uh, any action that you do on your Git repo, like if you're doing a push or a commit on your, on your repo, then we can automatically do a pull and do some actions for you on dev panel. So on your container, we can automatically do a Git pull and run a script for you and build your team and so on. Um, custom domains, you can set up a custom domain. And the, and the nice thing with this is you can migrate domains between different uh, applications. So for example, if you had a Drupal 7 site here and you have a domain running on that Drupal 7 site you, and you're creating a Drupal 9 site to replace that Drupal 7 site, once you have the Drupal 9 site up and running, you come over here and you can migrate that domain to that Drupal 9 site, right? And then you don't have to mess with your registrar. You don't have to mess with your DNS on the back end. We'll just, we'll, we handle the pointers internally. And, and, and if there's anything wrong with your Drupal 9 site and you want to revert back, then you just go back to your Drupal 7 site and you migrate the domain back to that Drupal 7 site. Right? So this way you can actually do blue-green deployments if you, if you know what blue-green means, which is you can have two deployments running side by side and you can switch between those um, and, and keep the old deployment running. So, so this, is a, this is a good way of doing that as well. It's a, it's a poor man's way of doing that. We have a more sophisticated way of doing it as well, but this is an easy way of doing it. You have your logs, uh, your PHP logs and your Nginx logs here. And you have your security. If you locked it, you can unlock it here. And you can actually create uh, static sites with, uh, with one click of your site. So I'll show you, and the static site is, is another good way of pushing everything to the CDN. And when you push everything to the CDN, you can actually come back over here and you can turn off, you can pause this application, it saves you on the resources and uh, it turns off your application so you cannot, this application cannot be hacked. Uh, so you can actually, if you, if you don't have the resources to patch or stay up to date on your dynamic site, for patching it for security and so on. Uh, what we recommend is that you create a static site and you go back and you pause your dynamic site. And then that way, whenever a security release comes up, 
You can come back over here when you're available and you have time, you can unpause it, apply your patches, create a new static site, and then you can pause your application at that time as well. So those are things you can do. When you create a static site, you get different versions of your static site as well. So you can go back and uh, deploy an older site if you want to as well. And that's mainly for compliance. Um, I will, I will show you, let me, let me go through my demo outline and see what else we're going to demo. Backup, restore, collaboration. Okay. Yeah. So let me go and show you a static site demo that we had, we had done in a, uh, our last, uh, webinar or uh, last conference. So here is um, for a proof of concept we're developing. Um, this is a master, there's a couple of branches here. And, and the, by the way, as you create more branches in your Git repo, those branches will show up over here automatically and then you can go in and deploy those branches. So here's the master branch. This is what the site looks like. This is the dynamic site. And then you can navigate through this. And this is your, if you go down here, this is the version of your static site. And you can see this as the CloudFront URL on it. It's super fast and works the same way. And basically, once you have this, you can go back through and you can turn off your, you can pause your uh, dynamic site. So this is, this is an example of your static and dynamic site. Now, the other thing we can do, I'm gonna go up one level. And I'm going to show. So under applications, you can see your applications that are running. You can do deployments. And these are different deployments that uh, you can do. And you can do tag based deployments if you wanted to. You can have uh, different people that uh, you have. Uh, you can invite different people to your teams as collaborators. You can have different namespaces, uh, manage your custom domains, activities, and so on. Anyway, so that's your different tools. Let me see what else we we're going to put serverless dynamic sites. Oh, and the quick starts. I will show you this. Um, panel.com slash try. So these are so these are uh, different quick starts you can do. Uh, you can set up any type of application. These are different templates that we've set up like open social. If you just go to devpanel.com slash try. There are different templates that we've set up for open social, open wise, CVCRM, Umami, and so on. But if you click on deploy, for example, it brings up a quick start uh, template and you just click a couple of buttons and it deploys this application for you. So using quick start, you can actually set up any type of template that you have, any type of application that you have um, for, uh, for your uh, organization. And you can set up your own catalog of application and they don't have to be Drupal or um, WordPress. We have people that are deploying Java applications and Python applications and so on. Okay, so that was, that was, uh, that was the tools demo. That was the dev panel demo. I'm gonna go back to the slides. Are there any questions?
Okay. So this is how this is what we have used with uh, with Voice of America, and uh, this is how we had actually taken them, and uh, this is what we had used to save them a ton of money on uh, on their hosting. Okay, and for static sites, this is the this is the tool chain that that uh, the workflow and the tool chain that we recommend that you can use. Uh, and this you can actually build this without even without using Dev Panel. Uh, this 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 whole machinery today that you have, you know, we use we use your PHP, you use your database, your server, varnish, memcache, everything is running. You can take all of this and put it behind your firewall, even if this is running on Pantheon or Acquia or whatever platform you're using. If you put this behind the firewall, you can still do your dev test staging. And staging by staging, I mean, you use this as your content editing site. Use your live site here as your content editing site. Put this behind the firewall. And then when you publish it, publish it to a CDN as a static site. For Drupal 9, for Drupal 8 and Drupal 9, you can use Tome, uh, which, is a, which is a Drupal module itself. Uh, for, for Drupal 7, there's other, uh, there's other ways of doing it. And, and if you do this, then, then you can actually take your, whatever's behind your firewall, you can disable it even, and, and you can patch it, you can delete it, you can do whatever you want with it, but it stays behind the firewall. So, and it's a, this is a great option for Drupal 7 sites. So, uh, especially if you don't have the budget or, uh, or the energy to, uh, or the time to do this, to do the upgrades. And if you want to try out uh, serverless, you can, uh, you can go try it out on uh, that panel. These are all the different demos that I showed you. So any questions? I want to open this up. If you guys want to just unmute yourself and ask questions, you're, uh, you're happy to. So. Hey Celine, JD here. Hey JD, I have uh, I have an unlimited number of questions, but um, that's great. We I'm have curious. we have a bunch of time, so <laughs> so I'm I'm new to serverless, uh, okay. and I'm I'm new to AWS. Okay. Um, so you're using Kubernetes. So is this based on AWS EKS? It is. And how does that compare to ECS? And Fargate. Um, Fargate is a is a is a container runner basically. So EKS can actually use Fargate too. We don't use Fargate, but uh, we we actually have that on our roadmap. So we're starting to use internally on our alpha site. We're we're starting to use Fargate as well. So with Fargate, uh, we don't have to manage. Um, EKS does not the uh, there, there's a component of EKS Kubernetes that's called the cluster autoscaler that does not have to manage the nodes. We we bring in spot instances and so on, and then we release them. So we don't have to manage that if we're using Fargate. Um, and that's that's a that's a more efficient way of going about it. So we're looking into that and we're building towards that. It's slightly more expensive than using than what we're using right now, but but then AWS manages everything. So it's it's better in a way. Sure. Um, ECS is 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 like EKS, it's like Kubernetes. It came, you know, it was more popular on AWS before Kubernetes was even available on AWS. Um, so ECS has been around, Elastic uh, Container Service has been around forever on, on AWS. It's their own proprietary technology. We, we use EKS, the Kubernetes, uh, Elastic Kubernetes Service, because Kubernetes is more industry standard. 
and there are more tools and services available that run inside that we can run inside Kubernetes. So that's what we have chosen to do. It's it's more uh, industry standard. So good question. Thanks. So yeah. So would would your I guess future roadmap of using Fargate? You'd still you say you still use EKS because mm -hmm. um, that's already kind of you know part of your your setup here. Yeah. Um, I guess the advantage of EKS over ECS is perhaps portability to other uh, infrastructure providers. Not, not just portability to other infrastructure providers, but the but the depth and the and the you know and the number of uh, applications that are available that we can run as inside Kubernetes. So those, those, those applications and the controls that are available out of the box with the Helm charts and everything that we can deploy in Kubernetes in seconds. Uh, it's just a big, the, the entire ecosystem that's available in Kubernetes is, is just huge. And again, it de-risks it de -risks you as a, as a consumer of this technology, because now you've got everything running in Kubernetes. If you ever want to dig in or you want to hire your own resources to manage this infrastructure, you can. Uh, the way we've designed DevPanel is that if you ever want to disconnect from DevPanel, your infrastructure is running in your account, so it keeps running. Uh, we don't penalize you. We don't like disconnect or disable your infrastructure. Uh, if you ever disconnect from DevPanel, your stuff keeps running in your account and you have full access to it. So you can hire your own resources, you can hire your own people and go in there and manage. So, yeah, so Kubernetes, cool. if you're going with Kubernetes, you have, uh, you have a wider pool of resources with it. And uh, anyone else, feel free to jump in, otherwise I'll just keep asking questions. <laughs> so um, Kubernetes is a, is that a container orchestrator? It is. Yeah. And, um, and so who, who creates the containers? Who manages the containers? That's the, that's the end user and client's responsibility. Yeah. So when you, when you deploy, for example, when you deploy uh, an application, we're creating, uh, we're creating, uh, you know, essentially just orders for Kubernetes to go create those containers, right? So uh, Kubernetes is creating those containers, but we are defining the, uh, the, the Helm charts and we're using Helm charts and things like that to actually create those containers, define those containers. Yeah. Okay, so the, the definitions for the creation of the containers, um, it sounds like DevPanel provides some sort of default ones and that can be mm -hmm. further customized is the idea. Absolutely. Absolutely. Those are all using YAML files and and uh, and then yeah, the deployments done using Terraform. The infrastructure is deployed using Terraform, and then the Kubernetes for Kubernetes, we're doing YAMLs and and the Helm charts and things like that. And those are all available to our customers to modify. And there's different levels of service. Like for enterprise customers, they can modify those things, but for customers that we host and we manage then we manage all of that. They don't modify it. Like we, we have a standard set of definitions that we manage because we can't customize it for all of them, so. Sure, and can you talk a little bit more about what uh, support services and kind of management you provide at an enterprise level? Like what, what is it that you actually do? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Uh, that's actually evolving as we speak, we're kind of new to the scene. So when customers come to us and they say, we want this, and we're like, okay, you know, uh, if we don't do it, we're like, okay, what do you, what do you want to pay for this? You know? And then if we can do it for them, then we'll do it for them. But uh, right now we're working in several different models. We started with just providing this control panel as a layer around their account. That was our original intent, okay? So we were just gonna provide a dev panel as a control panel around their account and we were going to provide them services, right? But then customers started coming to us saying, wait, 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 we don't want to manage our own AWS account. We want you to manage the account. 
In fact, we want you to own the account. <laughs> we don't want anything to do with AWS. We want to pay one bill, right? So, so we, started, we started doing that. And then, and then they came to us and said, well, we don't want to pay a variable bill. We want to pay a fixed bill, right? So we're like, okay, so now we're doing, essentially we're doing hosting. So we need different type of hosting plans and we need different levels. So we started doing that and we're doing that privately. We don't have it advertised on our website yet, but we're doing that for, and we started doing that for nonprofits essentially. They've come to us, a bunch of nonprofits have come to us saying, look, we want to do this as a group. And we wanna, we wanna be able to have, you know, uh, we wanna, we want like, we want you to manage a cluster for all the nonprofits. So we're working with, a, with an organization called Dev Collaborative and, uh, and Stephen Dubois, I don't know if you know him, but uh, he's, he's leading up the effort. And uh, so there, he's kind of leading up, you know, kind of brought together a bunch of nonprofits and we're, we're managing a cluster for them. Um, so that's, that's how we got into hosting. And then there are some companies that are like, that want to run their own cluster, that want, that are running big websites, and they just want us to provide uh, the control panel. And uh, some of them want us to provide services on a fixed uh, monthly basis, like fixed cost basis. And uh, they just have our support contract on a fixed cost basis. Some of them just wanna pay us on an hourly basis. So we do both. Yeah. Cool. Does that answer your question? I mean, it's a whole wide range of things. That, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's, mainly, it's mainly what the customer wants and what, how they want to pay. And, uh, and we're kind of going along with it for now because we're kind of new to, to uh, we don't have really like set defined plans, so. Yeah, so so Alex Alex says, yeah, high, higher ed needs fixed pricing. Yeah, so that's uh, we got into that same we got into that same situation where people needed fixed pricing. They were like, we cannot budget on variable pricing, right? So that was that was the that was the situation where organizations were like, we cannot budget on variable pricing. We need a fixed price and we need a fixed price PO to get it approved and to pay you again. So we're like, okay, we'll do fixed price PO. So yeah, we cannot allow you to save us. <laughs> yeah, that was that was. In fact, that was the same line that was given to us by another organization. So yeah, thank thank you for bringing that. <laughs> so yeah, we 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 told them that it was like, hey, variable pricing saves you money, but they were like, we can only do fixed pricing. Like, okay, we'll do fixed pricing with you, so no problem. And we, we end up absorbing the variability, which is, which is okay by us, you know, so. Other, other questions? There's one in the chat um, yes, from um, Alex Finarn. He says he doesn't have a mic, but uh, he says he's most interested in the serverless part and he wants to know if it compares to Laravel's Vapor at all. Uh, I don't know Laravel's Vapor. Uh, does anyone here know Vapor? We run Laravel, by the way. We, we just had an implementation of Laravel for another customer. They wanted to see it for Laravel running with database and they wanted to deploy a whole bunch of uh, sites on Laravel. So they're moving, they're actually moving away from Drupal and they're creating a whole Laravel uh, ecosystem applications for, for themselves in Laravel, so. Vapor, okay, let me bring it up.
auto scaling, serverless deployment, platform through layer, uh, AWS Lambda. Okay, we don't use Lambda, right? Um, yeah, so, so, yeah, this is a good point. Uh, if they're using Lambda, there is a difference between Lambda and how we do it, okay? Lambda actually scales down to zero. Okay, we don't scale down to zero. Um, so we, we have to have at least one container running to respond to requests. Uh, e even in a serverless environment, you, you can have containers running. Lambda can, can scale down to zero. Uh, in our architecture, we don't scale down to zero because we are running stateful uh, applications. So stateful applications need at least one container running. So our architecture supports both stateful and stateless uh, uh, apps. But uh, this, this, if they are running purely, if they're running on Lambda, then, uh, then they can actually run, they can actually scale down to zero. That means uh, you, know, you don't incur any cost while your application is not running. So if that is, if that is important to you, then, then this is this is great. But at the same time, we do use spot instances, which means you can save up to ninety percent on your regular uh, deployments. So a server that normally cost uh, underlying infrastructure that would normally cost seventy dollars, if you deploy containers on it, that server costs seven dollars, and you can run you know a bunch of sites on that server. Uh, that you're not even managing, but that server, the underlying server, the cost of that server goes down to, you know, from $70 to $7. So that's huge cost savings, right? And the next question is, I think Laravel code base is able to handle everything function seamless, yeah. Um, next question is, will Drupal make changes like Laravel to do this? I have no idea how this, um, Drupal is based on Symfony. I, I don't think it can, it'll be able to do this. Uh, you know, Mike might be in a better position to answer this. Um, I, don't, I don't think Drupal can go stateless, but uh, if it can, then, then, then we could support that. Uh, but uh, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't know, man. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what to say. Yeah, uh, the question, Mike, it was, uh, can, can Drupal go stateless? Can Drupal ever be a stateless application? Can it go uh, in, a, in a direction where you can run the whole thing on, uh, on Lambda, for, for instance? Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's close. I think that's, uh, I haven't seen anything where there's even like talk of that, so. Right. Yeah, I don't think that's in the cards right now, unless I'm, you know, I'm not paying attention enough. I think the closest thing I've seen to that is Tome, which will allow you to export everything yeah. to static site like the, sure. but it's not, you know, you can have it. It's almost like uh, a complete export of not just the, the way that we do config sync, but you can, can, you can export everything. So you don't need a database, but then right. it's exactly. not really dynamic. Like you can't edit it in that form. You need to bring it. It's like, you need to add a drop of water and rehydrate that whole Drupal site so you can edit it and then export it to Tome again. That's so it's really that's just snapshots. A, that's, that's a very good point, uh, Matt. Okay, Alex, to answer your question, to scale down to zero, okay. This is what you do. This is how you can actually go to scale down to zero. You create, you take your entire dev test live and, and this you can do in dev panel. You can do it even outside of dev panel. You take your entire engine right behind the firewall. You run your, your dev test live, you're editing your site. And then when you're done editing your site, you push it to a CDN, okay? You, you push all your assets into S3. You export it as a static site. You push all your everything into an S3 bucket. Roll a CDN around it, uh, and 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 you run your site as a static site. You shut down your engine on the back end. You put it on pause. Right now, you've scaled down to zero. 
Uh, you, you are not being charged anything if there's no traffic to that site, right? Th this is now, your Drupal site is now stateless, effectively, right? Right, is that, is that right, Matt? Is this what you're talking about? Yeah, so it, bravo, that would be how yeah. you would pull it off. I mean, it's yeah. a little weird, but that you could, you could essentially scale it down to zero by that right. kind of a, approach. Right. And, 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 and this is, uh, we're working with an organization that has, uh, that has over 200 Drupal 7 sites that they do not want to upgrade. And these are set up as multi-sites, right? They, they, they don't wanna upgrade them and they don't have the budget to upgrade them. They don't have the manpower to upgrade them. So we're just writing scripts to bring them over into dev panel, convert them into static sites and, and push them like this, turn off the backend. And now they're gonna be serving them as static sites. Uh, and and it's, you know, it's pennies to serve them as static sites. It, it's cost. Yeah, money. until you need to edit something and then you just need to spin up the back end temporarily right. and change whatever things you need to change and then take it back down again. Right, <laughs> and, and, and the beauty of this is, and I'm not recommending that you don't update your back end. okay? I'm not recommending that at all. But the way they're gonna use it is, for them, the back end is gonna be behind the firewall. They don't plan to patch them. They don't plan to patch the backend and they don't, they're just gonna shut it down. Like whatever happens, like they're just gonna, they don't have the staff to do it, right? So, so they're just gonna bring up the backend whenever they need to update content, they're gonna update the content, regenerate a new static site, shut down the backend, no need to patch it, right? And again, don't take, the, your takeaway should not be that you should not update the backend. You should always update you know, stay stay up to date with the security patches and so on, right? But but if you if you want to maintain Drupal seven on a long term basis, even after it goes out of uh, maintenance, then what do you do? Right. Okay, I know Laravel uses some Symfony components, router components. No idea. Okay, maybe Taylor Otwell just tender breath. Oh, Bref, I, I've heard of Bref. Another serverless PHP example. Yeah. I've heard, you know, I've heard of Bref. I have not looked into it. Yeah, using AWS Lambda. Definitely interesting. If you have a project, Alex, you want to use this in, ping me outside of this and uh, we can talk about this because uh, we'd, we'd love to prototype something and, uh, and get it running on Lambda because this looks kind of interesting and exciting. Yeah. So, all right. Um, any, any other questions? We're coming to the end of the hour here. Thanks. Salim, I've got a question. Yeah, go ahead, JD. I've got a question about um, running kind of other things on the server. Yeah. Um, so I've got you know client site and well, I guess first question is like, are there any complications with running brush commands against a quote unquote serverless architecture, or how does that work? No, you're running in a container, so you can run brush commands uh, as as much as you want. So. And how about reaching? I, I guess how about running those commands remotely? Uh, that you might have a, that you might have to do some engineering with. Or is so, it can you, can you SSH into the server? You cannot SSH into the server. Uh, you can, you can SSH out of the server and you can create a tunnel out of the, out of the container into something else, but you cannot SSH into the server. And this was actually done on purpose because we don't allow any, uh, any keys or anything like that. We have a single sign on policy for mainly for security reasons, because when somebody leaves your organization, we want to be able, you want to be able to cut them off at the dev panel login level. And when you cut them off at the dev panel login level, they're cut off from everything that they have access to. They, you cannot leave backdoors. Okay. So, so this was done for, because we were working with some of the government agencies 
And uh, this was this was one one uh, requirement for compliance and for security. So um, so you can you can you can call out of the server and create a tunnel, and then you can come back in through that tunnel. But if that if that it. container goes down, then then you're out. So so can you so you can run Drush commands from within Dev Panel Control Panel mm -hmm. on the server, mm -hmm. and I guess how can you like let's say you run a Drush command to like export a bunch of data or something like that mm -hmm. to the file system? How do you then get access to that? Uh, you, you can put that onto you can put it on you can push it on S3. So you okay. can you can create a you can you can put it in a bucket and you can create a you can have a private access to that bucket outside of the container itself. So even if the container comes up, creates that export, pushes it to S3, then you can actually go back into S3 whenever even if the container is shut down, you will always have access to that file because you'll have the keys to that S3 bucket. And that's how we got create, it. Uh, that's how we handle backups. We put them and in logs, S3. presumably. And logs, yeah. And logs, okay. logs can actually be sent to uh, CloudWatch and other services where the logs are monitored, not just stored. So. Sure. Okay. And final question related to Drush. So, <clears throat> at a client website where they are basically running Drush on the server, kind of in a forever loop to process queues. Um, okay. I know. Uh, I guess <laughs> is there a kind of obvious like is it is that sort of out of the box a possibility with this architecture or is it kind yeah, of Yeah, it's not a problem. Yeah. It's not a problem. You just you just go into your container, you just go into your your one of the containers is on all the time essentially and then it's just running crash. So Got it. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, and it's uh it's the same thing like uh you know people want to run cron jobs and stuff like that. So it's just a uh, you can schedule it across multiple containers, or you can have one container sit there and just run your jobs for you. So. Yeah, it's a di it's different way of uh, of looking at it for especially for stateful applications. These are these are different way of architecting these type of solutions. So yeah, yeah, we can uh, we can talk about these uh, even outside this uh, this call, JD. So if you have a list of things, uh, let me know. Yeah, see you later. Okay. If there's nothing else, I wanna I wanna thank everyone that's here, and uh, this is a thank you for having me, uh, esteemed, and thank you for having me, Matt and Matt. Yeah, and, thanks for being here, Salim. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been my pleasure. And uh, if there's any questions outside of this, uh, feel free to uh, uh, ping me and uh, get a hold of me. Let me go to my uh, contact screen. So there's my contact information. If there's, uh, if you guys need to get a hold of me, there's uh, it's my information. I'm on uh, Drupal Slack as well, so feel free to hit me up, Celine. And you're in the Steam Slack. And I'm in the Steam Slack as well. That's right. I, I believe I'm Salim over there too. So yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks everybody. I'll go ahead and uh, post this on YouTube and get it out to you all uh, later tonight. Thanks, Celine. Thank you. Take care. Bye.